Next talk is uh, bulk superconductivity in single phase oxides at temperatures above 90 Kelvin by um, Bertram Batlog. Okay, thank you. That should be all right. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I would like to talk about, give a short summary of an extensive work that has been done on oxide superconductors at Bell Labs over the last few years. And these are the people I would uh, very much like to appreciate their collaboration with. And I would like to mention two names in particular. <coughs> Excuse me. It's Bob Carver and Bruce Van Dole. Superconductivity research in oxide superconductors that uh, goes back quite a few years. As Professor Miller has pointed out, we have been working on, we have been working on Thank you. We started working on barium lead bismuth oxide quite a five, six years ago, and through our work on very high quality single crystals, we gained lots of insight about the sub oxide superconductors. Then through the, through the last three months, through substitution of strontium in the lanthanum barium copper oxide, TC was raised to 38 degrees. And finally, I would like to concentrate on, on the latest compound because it has the highest DC, and also because uh, we don't have much time to talk about the other ones. I will not present many experimental curves, but rather like to emphasize how similar all these superconductors are among themselves and how much different they are from the rest of the superconducting families. After we heard about the superconducting behavior at around 95 degrees in the copper ytrium barium system by the Alabama Houston collaboration, we realized that it was absolutely necessary to identify the superconducting phase uh, in order to gain further insight as well as to possibly proceed to higher TCs. Therefore, we started a systematic investigation of the Turner phase diagram, starting with a few known compounds and this composition that was published. Uh, less than three days, uh, sorry, three and a half days after we, go we got this report from Houston, we had identified the superconducting phase as being barium-2, ichium copper-3, and some oxygen there. Oxygen was not known. As you can deduce from some rules, this is the green compound which lies down here. So if one makes, which is barium ichium 2 copper 5 as, as we just heard also before, uh, if one makes this composition, we automatically get mainly, uh, say, two-thirds of the green stuff and one-third approximately of the superconducting material. Uh, through detailed oxygen analysis, it, we figured out that the oxygen concentration should be O7. So we, sh we can talk about essentially an, an oxygen deficient perovskite, which generally would be written in ABO3 times 3. However, we don't have nine oxygens there, we rather have seven oxygens. At that time, we proposed uh, an orthorhombic cell, a uh, long time ago, two weeks ago actually. Uh, <laughs> and in the, in the meantime, a single crystal X-ray diffraction work by Sigrid and Sunshine have confirmed this, con this original projection. And that's a structure of, that's, uh, that's one unit cell. It appears rather dark, I apologize for that. Uh, I would like to point out that we start out from the perovskite, stack three layers of them. But since we do not have nine but seven oxygen, we have to take out one complete layer adjacent to the yttrium and one half of the layer around here. So what we are, what we are left over was essentially two layers of copper oxygen, which are slightly buckled. And then in this layer, a random distribution of oxygen vacancies amounting to one half. Uh, th th that's the structure starting from this insight and observing that the barium and the yttrium are regularly distributed. It's a, that's, that's why we get three unit cells there. It's, we are three times the A site occupied here. We started immediately uh, substituting at different sites and that's a, just a preliminary list of compounds we made. Don't uh, focus on all of them. I just like to point out that one can substitute both on the barium side as well as on the ethereum side. And uh, one particular nice substitution, which I like, is, is the one with europium, completed substitution with europium. It drives up TC quite a few degrees, gives a very sh sharp transition, which is less than one degree wide, actually 0.7 degree wide from 90 to 10% level. Uh, 
I will come back to this particular compound later if I talk about upper critical fields. So instead of showing all the very few graphs, I just flash this one resistance curve. On, on, on this resistance, I would like to point out one thing particular. It is that the resistivity it is a normal state behavior, which is quite unusual. First of all, it is a quite good material if you would extrapolate down there. It's a damn good, a good metal. Not only, of course, it goes superconducting there with a quite narrow transition width in itself, but also this linearity in, in resistivity has not only been observed in this material, but also in the lanthanum strontium copper oxide and in the barium lead bismuth oxide based single crystals. We never published it, but we have them. So there's a commonality in, in, this, in this oxide superconductors. This linearity and resistivity together with the very unusual optical properties that uh, uh, Jornstein, Gordon Thomas, and Doug Rapkin measured in our lab, I don't have time to show them, and also the fact that the, in the normal state, this material has a considerable curve wise contribution to the susceptibility. All these three facts together make us believe that these are not ordinary metals at all. And these are taken as ingredients to some theories, and uh, we'll have a, a talk later tonight which invoke unconventional pairing, meaning non-electron non phonon pairing, leading to superconductivity. That's one aspect. Uh, of course, these are measurements on, on phase pure material. And it's absolutely no second phase whatsoever there, undetected in X-rays. Uh, one acid test for, for bulk superconductivity is a true Meissner effect, not to be confused with DC magnetization or AC sustainability measurements. In an experiment like that, one could sample steadily in a field without moving the field, nor moving, uh, nor changing the sample position with respect to the field. What you observe is a very rapid drop at TC, and there's a Meissner signal of about 76% of independently measured diamagnetic value. This is a very large value compared to any superconductor because one always has trapped flux in a, in a sample. So that's a lower conservative limit of the bulk uh, of the volume fraction that is superconducting, and I think it's the best, best measurement to prove that it is spike superconductivity. Let me summarize all the data on this view graph. Don't read all the numbers, it's not necessary. But uh, I like to compare the three compounds here, barium bismuth oxide, lanthanum strontium, and the barium medium copper here with each other. These are TCs. Uh, of course, we measured HC1 magnetically, HC2 as function of, in, in resist, resistive measurement up to very high fields at the magnet lab, but third, we measured up to 30 tesla resistively. Uh, these are values here, typically about one to two tesla per degree, a slope for the upper critical field. Now, there are two points which I'd like to point out. One is the Sommerfeld parameter, which we have derived from various measurements independently. They all give consistent results, and I was somewhat surprised seeing the large value of 25. At, uh, we found for the barium medium copper oxide uh, a gamma value in the usual units of millijoules per mole Kelvin squared of about three to five only, which is even lower than the one in lanthanum strontium and is uh, only slightly higher than it is in barium red bismuth oxide. So these are very low density of states at the Fermi level compared to others. I will come back to this point explicitly in the next view graph. Then there is the next point which we would like to keep in mind. It's not only measuring HC2 for potential applications, but rather, we'd like to know what the critical current density is. <laughs> well, <are> we <laughs> Great. Uh, I have to raise. Uh, we have here, uh, in barium red bismuth oxide, the critical current density, even in, in very good material, was only about 10 amps per square centimeter. Uh, Westinghouse Group, I think, will report tonight other measurements. Uh, we agree with them having values of order 1,000 amps per square centimeter. And when we did the measurement on the barium medium copper oxide uh, at 77 degrees and zero field, just dunking it in helium without a sophisticated measure, we could not drive it normally because, we had, because of our contacting problem, we can say that the critical current density exceeds 1,100 amps per square centimeter. That's a very nice number for a beginning. Uh, Let's come back to superconducting materials here, and I'd like to compare this oxide superconductor with all the rest of superconductors we know. I hope you find your favorite down here. If not, I, we can put it on. It certainly <laughs> will, it will certainly not exceed this line. That's an empirical line beyond which no superconductor had been observed. It's a TC versus gamma plot, double logarithmic scale, so we can catch the recent, de recent developments here. So if you flip over our oxide superconductors, that's where they are. 
These are the red points, barium red bismuth oxide, lanthanum strontium copper oxide, and the 90 degree material. It is rather clear that their TC is about a factor of four, in this case it's higher than the TCs of comparable superconductors. And in this case, the TC is a factor of 10 higher than it is for superconductors with a comparable density of states of the Fermi level. I take this as a quite interesting indication that we might have to think about new mechanisms for superconductivity. And I'm sure that that's a very active field going to be over the next few years. In the meantime, however, uh, let me assure you that development in terms of potential technical application have already started. <laughs> and if, if we want to do that, it's one aspect is looking at the upper critical field. And that's, that's a collection of the upper critical fields, again, for, for, for the three favorite oxide superconductors. And that's the blue line. Just concentrate on, on the higher one, highest TC material here. Uh, this is the blue line for the, just for the barium, yttrium, copper oxide. We substituted part of the yttrium by europium and found an upper critical field slope, which is about roughly three times higher, taken at the midpoint. You can imagine where it extrapolates to. Uh, it goes uh, something like, uh, well, two megagauss or so, if you extrapolate the town t equals zero. That's not, the, that's not the point to make here. I think we should be somewhat conservative and say, where does the material go normal? And that's indicated by the width of the bars, because the transition broadens in, in high fields due to the fact that one has anisotropic behavior. Okay. The, the anisotropy of the conduction state, very much like in the, in the layer compound, smears the TC out. Uh, so if we were to make a magnet out of that, just in our minds, and like to operate at the 77 degrees, we would be able to operate it in a, a field range, say, for 20 Tesla or so, to be somewhat conservative. That is the same field as we get under best circumstances nowadays in our labs, and we are very proud to have these magnets that work up to 18 Tesla at 4.2 degrees. That's one aspect which I find fascinating. Uh, do we have wires of that? No, we do not have wires, however. I can show you something else which I find quite interesting, and that brings up a point which we haven't stressed this evening yet, namely that these compounds are ceramics. These compounds can be fabricated in all the highly developed ceramic processes. For instance, what comes to my mind is making a superconducting toroid, as for instance this one, that's, that's superconducting above 90 degrees. Uh, it, it traps flux, as Mike Georgi has measured, it, the toroid was made by Dave Johnson. Uh, that's not a superconducting uh, solenoid yet, but I like to show you something similar to that. Namely, it was surprising to me that those things exist. One can make tape of this material. That is uh, that's a, uh, in the so-called green stage, where the material is not fired yet. That's, uh, that's one, one piece of that here, as you might see. Uh, you can shape it in any form you like. You can wind it up for a coil or whatever you like, to, then fire it, and you have a superconductor, which we have measured, and I just got the curve here. This foil indeed goes superconducting above 90 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let me finish with the following remarks. Barium lead bismuth oxide was the beginning. It was, we recognized it, many people did not recognize it, that this was a highly underpriced stock in the market of high T supercon superconductivity. Lanthanum strontium oxide was, uh, was the next step. Now we did all the work I just described to you, and there are many reasons why we are excited and working in this field. One is the physical aspects of it. We are having low gamma materials, very high TCs, and we certainly have to think about new mechanisms, at least think about them. That's one way I think we are all glad working in this field. The other thing is that, as I just tried to convey a little bit of a flavor of it, it might be quite possible that, to the fact that these are ceramics, that we have high upper critical fields and not so discouraging values for the critical current density, which might, might lead us to potential applications a few years from now, and I think our life has changed. Thanks a lot.
you very much bertram we now